As a math professor, I have taken a lot of exams in my life. Undergraduate exams, graduate qualifying exams, even my PhD oral defense. It's a lot. Now ideally, learning should be spread out over time so that you're not all just cramming at the last moment, but we're all human. I once remember when I was studying till 3.30 a.m. for my PhD defense, then got up at 5 a.m. to go and catch a plane to a job interview where I started studying for the job interview on the plane. It happens. So in this video, I'm going to share my study system, what I do to cram effectively in a short period of time. Before we get into the video, I wanted to say that exams can be stressful, they can be anxiety inducing, but your grade on your exam doesn't define you. Whether your cramming turns out to be effective and you get the grade you want or not, it doesn't depend on whether you're going to be a successful mathematician, whether mathematics is going to be something for you. So study hard, sure, but also be kind to yourself. Now, the first thing I always do at the beginning of the exam period is to try to map out my schedule through the exam period. Here in Canada, for instance, students typically have about five exams over perhaps 10 days or two weeks. It's a lot. So what I like to do is map out not just when I have exams, but when I'm going to do what type of studying. For example, I'll have this block where I'm going to review my past tests in physics, and this other block is when I'm going to do a bunch of practice problems for calculus. Note that the research suggests that your learning is better first when it's spaced out over time, and secondly when it's interleaved, which means that you take many different types of content, perhaps from different courses, and sort of do them back to back. So the point here is it's much more effective to spread your studying over multiple courses and exam period out over multiple days than it is to do all of your studying for one course followed by all of your studying for another. It's actually going to feel worse because you're going to start forgetting from one study session to the next, but that forgetting and then retrieving it back into your consciousness is what's going to allow you to remember it on the test. I also like having a schedule because that psychological effect of going and crossing off something like you've accomplished this block of studying that you meant to do, I feel like it really kind of amps me up and gives me the motivation I need to continue. So what should you actually put into your study schedule? When I speak to students who are disappointed about their grade, students who predicted that they would have done better than they ultimately did, one of the things I've noticed is that they often tell me about all the passive things they did. They read my notes, they watched my YouTube videos, they looked through the solutions to past tests. All of those things are great, but they're passive in the sense that you're consuming this content that somebody else, a, a math professor, some sort of expert in math has presented. This is in contrast to active learning, where you are in the driver's seat, where you're taking charge of your own learning, and you're doing things like solving problems yourself, or building out a concept map, or making a prediction about what's going to be on the test. And so a lot of my suggestions in this video are going to be about how to incorporate active learning elements into your study system. One example of getting active learning is actually reading of class notes, which I just said was passive, and it can be. Often when people read class notes, they're sort of skimming through their content and they're recognizing things they've seen in the past, but there isn't a lot of active learning. And so I have three different tricks. Trick number one, if your professor did an example in the notes, then you can just take a piece of paper, you cover up the worked out solution to that example, and I want you to try it yourself. Of course, if you get stuck, the solution is right there, but the point is, you want to have that verification that yes, you can do it on your own. You do understand this well enough to solve this problem, and you're not understanding it only when you're reading it from somebody else. You can do the same thing with the textbook, you just cover up the examples, you try them yourself, and this is an excellent source of practice problems. Second, after you've gone through one section of the notes or the textbook, what I like to do is I like to sit back, I like to close my eyes, and I try to summarize what was the big, say, three points of that previous class? Like, what was the big idea? What was the big story? What was the major takeaways from that class? It's easier to be following along at all the individual details than it is to provide that large, big picture summary. But the large, big picture summary is probably how your professor is thinking about their exam when they're trying to choose what exam problems to put on there. They're going to choose the ones that are sort of big and important and central to their course. Third trick, as you're going through, don't just look at what it was that you were covering. Try to figure out why were you covering it. Why did the professor do this? Why were they doing this specific example? Why did they introduce this type of idea? Don't just say what was it that they were doing, what example did they come up with, and what new idea did they come up with. If you're always sitting there trying to figure out the why, why, why of it, that's being actively engaged. 
and you're going to really learn the material a lot deeper. Next up, and you can do this in parallel to reading through your class notes, I really like to make a big scaffold of the entire content for the course. As I study, I'm going to keep coming back to this and updating it, but it creates a scaffold so that I can visualize all the connections between the topics and everything I do later on in my studying, I can figure out where does it fit into this larger scaffold. At the beginning of your studying, you might remember nothing more than perhaps just the titles of the chapters, but as you keep on working, you make your big concept map more and more details and try to visualize exactly what was going on, the big ideas in the course. Now it's time for practice problems, and I mean a lot of them. I want practice problems to be the bulk of your studying. But if you're cramming, you only have limited amounts of time. And so with practice problems, you have to be kind of efficient about them. So how do you get in lots of practice while still being efficient? My first efficiency trick is to use some tech tools, and a particularly cool one, and I'm very proud to say the sponsor of today's video, is Maple Calculator. Take a photo of something like an integral, and it will just evaluate it for you. This is great for verifying that a problem you're working on, that you actually have gotten the right answer. It sort of takes away that anxiety. But even better, Maple Calculator will show you the steps that it took to get there. This is particularly useful if you're going through some computation, you've got the wrong answer, and you can't quite figure out why. You can go and look at the solution and try to compare and figure out exactly where you were going wrong. Now, you do have to be careful when using a very powerful tool like this that you're not using it as a crutch. That is, you want to make sure that you're really emphasizing deeply understanding what is going on with that particular problem, but you're using that tool just to cut out some of the time of you spinning your wheels, either not quite getting the right answer or not knowing how to get started. I also think tools like these can be useful if you have a routine computation that you're confident you know how to do, you don't need to practice it, but it's just part of a longer example, so then you can just get that routine computation done in Maple Calculator and move on with your life. My second trick related to practice problems is to really pay a lot of attention to the similarities and the differences in the problems that you're doing. What I want you to do is to be able to look at a problem on a test to be able to categorize it, to know sort of what learning objective it's testing, and to immediately be able to formulate a plan or a strategy to be able to solve that problem. Students often complain that a test question is really unfair, that it wasn't done in the notes, it wasn't done in the homework. But most of the time that happens in my experience, it actually is pretty similar to something in the notes or in the homework. It's just that there's some details that obscure the similarities. And if you're really focusing on sort of the structure and categories of problems that you can be asked, this is just going to make it way easier for you on the test to just quickly know what strategy you're supposed to use. Similarly, have you ever noticed that textbooks have these like blocks of questions where all of the questions in the block are really just testing the same learning objective? I think you should always do one problem from each of those blocks just to make sure you can do that learning objective. If it's pretty easy, you can probably skip the rest of the problems. If you find it challenging, it's worthwhile doing multiple questions on the same learning objectives so you can see the small different differences that can sometimes trip people up. Next up is past mistakes. I think this is so important to go back through your past homeworks, quizzes, and tests and figure out what did you do right and what did you do wrong. For the problems that you did right, you want to know that you can quickly articulate the correct strategy to solve them again. Maybe you don't need to redo them, but you should be able to sort of verify that yes, you could redo them if you wished. But for the ones that you screwed up on, I want you to be really self-reflective on exactly why did you screw it up. Was it a simple computational mistake? Was it that you didn't know the definition of a term? Did you not understand some larger geometric concept? Or was it that you didn't know how to formulate a strategy to put all the different elements in the problem together. Each of these different types of mistakes is going to imply things about your studying. For instance, let's suppose that you couldn't recollect some particular concept. Well, this might inform you that you should be spending more of your time reflecting on the key concepts from the course. And then if you're doing practice problems, maybe this signals that instead of just sort of working through the mechanics of the problem, you really need to be thinking, well, what are the underlying concepts that are involved here? One really helpful thing is to go and actually make a document where you collect all of those past mistakes or new ones you're discovering in your studying that you want to put in one place to review, the, the things that are being most challenging for you historically. 
This is Maple Learn, which is the other product from today's sponsor that I really wanted to share with you. Maple Learn is kind of like Maple Calculator on steroids because it lets you write this entire document full of problems where you can just immediately graph things, evaluate things, see the step-by-step -step solutions. Sadly, I never had Maple Learn back when I was an undergraduate and studying, but I would always try to put all of my challenging problems together into one document so that I could review the hard things in one place. And I think that Maple Learn is just going to be a very helpful tool for doing that. The idea of reviewing your past mistakes is part of a larger idea called self-regulated learning. And the idea is that everybody's optimal study path is going to be a little bit different. And you should be really reflecting and paying attention to how your studying is going and how you might need to adapt if it's not as effective as possible. Because how do you even know whether your studying is any good or not? Well, one trick is to be constantly self-assessing. That's what I was talking about earlier when I was saying don't just read the solutions to some example, cover it up and see whether you can do it. That's a self-assessment. It gives you information as to whether or not you need to study things in this particular category or not. As opposed to studying everything broadly, which you can't really do all that much when you're cramming, you're going to be narrowly focusing in on precisely those things that are most challenging for you, that you most need to focus on for the test. I want you to be brutally honest about how effective your studying is going and maybe at the end of every single hour just do a quick self-check-in to think back over your studying. Was that what you needed to be doing right now or should you be switching gears after a short break when you start studying for the next hour? Perhaps my favorite tip of all is about predictions. There's an enormous amount of research about the efficacy of making predictions and how that actually helps your studying. The way I like to do this is for every different major section of the textbook, I try to figure out what is an easy problem, a medium problem, and a hard problem that your instructor is likely to put on the test. Doing this is a very high level skill because it requires you to reflect on what the learning objectives are. It requires you to understand the basic concepts. It, it requires you to have some familiarity with the types of problems in a particular section. So I normally make my predictions relatively late in my studying after I've gained quite a bit of familiarity with all the different content. And I remember the more I practiced predicting what my professors were going to put on the test, the more I could almost write a test that, yes, it's not the exact same questions, but it's the same learning objectives. And that was extremely beneficial for me being able to get a good grade on a test. Now, you can cram all you want on a test, but we're all human, right? Like we all have physical limitations. And so things like physical exercise, your eating, your sleeping, taking breaks, all of this is really important and you should put it as part of your strategy for cramming. Personally, I like the study method where I do 50 minutes on and then 10 minutes off. In those 10 minutes, I'm going to get up, I'm going to move around, I'm going to leave my study space. And this is just going to allow my mind to just have a bit of a reset and able to come back fresh at the top of the next hour. I think you should be sneaking in just a little bit of exercise once every day or two. Just could be a short run or some body weight exercises. Eat actual meals, not just endless sugary snacks and caffeine, and try to get a good night's sleep. Now, I know probably everybody knows these things, but when you're cramming for a test, it's so easy to let those be the things that go away because you're trying to like, I can get an extra hour if I don't bother doing any of those things. Except I think it actually hurts you. I think you are better off, your memory, your recollection, your focus is going to be better off if you take those breaks to eat and sleep and exercise. So I really encourage you to think about being healthy while you're in exam season. All right, so those are my cramming tips. I hope you don't have to cram, but if you do, perhaps they will be helpful for you. I'd love to hear your cramming tips. Leave those down in the comments below. Definitely check out Maple Calculator and Maple Learn. The link is in the description. And with that, we will do some more math in the next video.